Testament reading for today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 7 through 13. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentile shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Today marks the third week in Advent. Advent is a time of waiting and preparing for the coming of Christ. And all of us get ready for Christmas Day. I think as we do that, it is fair to ask ourselves, what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for the joy and the hope and the peace from our Savior born on Christmas Day? Is Christmas a time to witness to Christ's power, proclaiming his lordship and moving from darkness into light? Is Christmas the most wonderful time because it is a reminder that God gave us his only son sent in the world to teach, to guide, and to show us grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Maybe Christmas is special because it's God's way of telling us that we are not alone in this world and that the living presence of Christ loves us and is with us each and every day. Are we waiting for Christmas because it's a time of renewal, a time for family, for traditions, for showing those that we love the most how much we care for them? Do we wait for Christmas because of the celebrations, the festivities, the holiday meal, the decorated houses, the lights, and of course, the presents? What are we waiting for when we enter into a time of Advent? Do you revel in the shopping, the long lines, or the ability to do everything on Amazon.com? Are you waiting for those famous Christmas characters that we have all come to love? Santa, Frosty, Rudolph, and Olive. You know about Olive. She's in that song. She's, she's very much part of the Rudolph story, and she's in that song all of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. Christmas means lots of things to lots of people. For most, it's a time of family. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of goodwill. For the Christian, Christmas is all of this. It is all of this, and it is first and foremost about Christ. In our scripture for today, Paul is wrapping up his letter to the Romans, and in chapter 15, he is making his final appeal that all people in the church, whether weak or strong, whether Jew or Gentile, should be seen as one in Christ. And it is in that last verse of today's scripture that we find our focus. In verse 13, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. As we prepare and wait for Christmas, I want it to be a time of hope, a time of joy, and a time of peace. Now in his daily study Bible, William Barclay has something to say about each of these words. And I want us to look at these words, look at what Barclay says about them, and see what that does for us as we wait for Christmas. The first word is hope. Now, Mr. Webster defines hope as something to desire with expectation of obtainment. When we hope for something, we really want it to happen. And it is usually in the context of something 
positive. I hope I get that promotion. I hope I get into that college of my choice. Hope is a word we, we use when we yearn for something good to happen or when we are wanting that silver lining at the end of a dark tunnel, the silver lining in the cloud, the light at the end of the tunnel. I hope my friend makes a full recovery. Hope is that concept we hold on to when times are hard. It becomes our reason for not quitting and our goal so that we can persevere. When things are at their worst, we hold on to hope. And that's because sometimes our lives can be rough and they can be hard and they can be unfair. Sickness, disease, fatal accidents, conflicts, economy, job loss, divorce, world tension, change. All of these events can bring us down and make us feel as if there is no hope, no end, no relief in sight. But for us as Christians, there was always that sure and certain hope. Now here is what Barclay says about hope in this chapter of Romans. No one is hopeless so long as there is the grace of Christ. And no situation is hopeless so long as there is the power of God. So no matter the circumstance, no matter the difficulty, no matter the limits to which we are pushed in Christ, there is hope. Jesus gives us hope because Jesus gives us grace and forgiveness and peace and humility. Jesus gives us the benefit of the doubt. And in Christ, we are always, always, always given one more chance. Now that is something to be hopeful for. The second word that Paul uses is joy. Joy is the emotion evoked by well-being success or good fortune. Pleasure or happiness can be a, an in-the-moment type emotion, but in joy there is an inner happiness that delights the heart. There is a more permanence in the emotion of joy. And Barclay says this about joy, Christian joy is not dependent on things outside of humanity. It sources in our consciousness of the presence of the living Lord and the certainty that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So if I put that in my own words, I would say, God loves you. There is nothing you can do to make God love you, and there is nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. That is joy. And the third word Paul uses is peace. Well, what is peace? Well, once again, if we rely on Mr. Webster for the third time, we find out that peace is a state of tranquility or quiet. It is freedom from disquieting emotions. It is the achievement of harmony in personal relationships. Peace is one of those words that we use a lot. In the right frame of mind and setting, we can have peace of mind or peace and quiet. In reference to our faith, we say things such as a peace that passes all understanding, peace on earth, and we think of Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Peace can be defined as the absence of war, and usually when at war, sooner or later, both sides sign a peace treaty. We have the tendency in our lives to keep the peace, to make one's peace, and to be at peace. Whether we have it, want it, or need it, peace seems to be something that is very much part of our lives. There are some who take worry to an extreme. They either worry about every little nuance, or they are so laid back they don't worry about absolutely anything. But for most of us, worry is part of our existence. We worry about our children, their safety, their well-being, their choices. We worry about our health, our jobs, our happiness. Some worry about their finances and their security. And most of us worry about things that never come to pass and our fears and worries are usually for nothing. Not always, but usually. Barclay says this about peace, the only end to worry is the utter conviction 
that whatever happens, God's hand will never cause his child a needless tear. I love the very imagery of that sentence. And just hearing those words brings peace to my heart. It's, it's serene and it fills me with peace to think that that's how God treats us. And it also fills me with hope and with joy. Now, as we wait for Christmas, we not only wait what Christmas means to us, but as we prepare and wait for Christmas, we do so as Christians who have joy and peace and hope in their hearts. Because for us at Christmas time, our focus is on Jesus. So I'm going to try and bring all this together with a story. So I am going to move a little bit because I, I don't need the sermon now. But I'm going to move a little bit, but I'm hoping that it's, it's going to be okay with the, you know, with, with the pillars. This is a story about a, a, a man. He's, he doesn't have a name in the story. He's either called the man or the old man. And, and the story of him and his son. He was a single father, and he raised his only son by himself. And the boy's name was Mark. And this man was a bit older when he had his son Mark, and it was just the two of them. So... In order to connect with his son, he introduced him to the art world. This man was quite the art collector and had priceless, pri priceless pieces of art in his collection. And so he shared this with his son, and the two of them, as the boy grew up, had this love of art and actually amassed quite a wonderful, priceless art collection. And as the boy grew up, he came to appreciate the art that his father had. And as the boy became a man, they lived in a place where their nation was at war. So when the boy became an adult, it was his time to sign up and go off to war. And he did. And he was gone eight months, maybe a year, when the father got word that his son had been killed in the war. And not only killed, he'd been killed while saving the life of a fellow soldier. And now this man's in this big very big empty house and he's all by himself and the art on the walls that gave him pleasure the art on the walls that reminded him that his son is doing something worthwhile now just serve to remind him of his loneliness and the fact that his son's never coming home but one Christmas morning there's a knock at the man's door and he opens the door to find a young man named Tom Tom introduces himself and says I was a friend of your son and not only was I a friend, I was the one he saved when he lost his life. I'm wondering if we could talk. So they go into the library and they talk for hours. They talk about their own lives, they talk about the war, and of course they talk about Mark. And in this conversation, the man learns what his boy was like, how kind he was, how decent he was, how much he did for other people in the army in, in, the, in the military and he learned that not only did he save Tom's life but he saved a dozen other people before that day that eventually took his life and so the father kind of got a sense of peace and a sense of satisfaction with what his son did and that his son's life had meaning and before he left Tom said to the man he said I know all about your art collection and how famous it is and I know how much you and your son love to do this he said, now I'm an artist, and I have a picture, a portrait that I've painted for you. It's never going to make your collection. It's never going to hang anywhere. But it's something that I thought you might like to have. And he opens up the portrait, and it's a picture of his son. And it's in striking detail. And he takes down above the mantel his most famous and priceless piece of art, and he puts the picture of his son up instead. And this really helped the man deal with his grief because now he knew that his son had a purpose and now he knew that his son could live on because of the care and the time and the detail that this man put into painting this picture. So time went on, you can figure what that was, a year, two years, time went on and, and the man, who was an old man, he, he dies, he dies natural course, natural time in life, he, he dies. And when he dies, the art world is very pleased because with the man now having, having died and the son 
having died earlier, they know that this famous priceless art auction is this art is going to be up for auction. And the man's attorney makes all the arrangements and it's stipulated in his will that the art auction was to be held on Christmas Day because that was the day the man received his greatest gift. So they gather everybody on Christmas Day and the attorney says, now just so you know there are some stipulations about how we do this auction in the will and we need to follow them. And he says, and uh, the first stipulation is, is that before we do all the priceless art, we first must auction off the portrait of the old man's son. That's in the will, and that must be done. He says, I'm going to ask for an opening bid of $100 for this portrait of the man's son. And everybody just sat there, kind of like you're doing now, just, just <laughs> sat there. No, no hands went up, no, just kind of, just like that. And so the, the lawyer said, folks, it, the, the will is clear. Nothing can go forward until this picture is sold. And a man in the back said, I'll bid on the picture. I knew the man. I knew his son. They were friends of mine. I'd like to have it. And I'll offer you the opening bid of $100 for the, for, for the painting. And, and the, the attorney said, going once, going twice, sold for $100. And when he said sold instantly, the room erupted in cheers and thunderous applause because now they knew they were getting to the good stuff, the priceless art. And the attorney calmed down the room and he said, thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. This ends our auction. Please drive safely as you make your way out the building. And of course, there was a room filled of frustration and confusion and anger because they demanded to know what was going on. There was art from, pick a famous artist in your head, and that artist's picture was in this collection. This was priceless art worth millions and millions of dollars, and people demanded to know what was going on. And the lawyer said, folks, I'm sorry, I'm simply reading the stipulations that appear in the will, and I'll read it for you. It says, whoever takes the sun gets it all. Cool. cool story. Whoever takes the sun gets it all. That's what we get as Christians in this life. When we take Jesus into our lives and into our hearts, we get it all. We get hope. We get joy. We get peace. We get love. We get forgiveness. We get Christmas. And we get eternal life. So let us Gracious God, we thank you for all that you give. By giving your son to live and die and live with us, we get everything in this life and the life to come. And that gives us hope and peace and fills our heart with joy, now and always. Amen. <laughs>